Okay, uh, let's begin. Welcome all to uh, AY22 and our first uh, no monthly meeting of 2022. So I think uh, most of us are kind of familiar with the, the format of this uh, meeting now, but uh, in case you're not, so it's intended to be quite an interactive session. It's uh, yeah, more meeting than webinar, so please participate. Yeah, if you've uh, got, an interesting, yeah, got a, a comment to make or a question to ask. Um, yeah, I think we're a, a, a suitable size crowd that you can probably just unmute and speak up. If it starts to get uh, you know, very interactive, then um, you know, we'll, we'll move to raising a hand. But yeah. Um, we also have the nurse user Slack. Uh, I'll post the slides out shortly, actually. Um, in case you haven't seen the Slack already, here's a link to how to join it in the uh, chat here. You'll need to you'll need to log in on www.nurse.gov to be able to see the uh, the page that this is on. Uh, our general follow uh, our pattern of uh, we'll start off with a, a win of the month and followed by sort of a today I learned, which is an opportunity to discuss uh, interesting things you've. Uh, uh, done, experienced, or discovered, or tripped up on recently while using NASC systems. We'll have a few announcements and uh, calls for participation. And then we have our topic of the day. And I see uh, Chris Yazan has been doing some interesting work on uh, how to set up his uh, climate runs at NERSC to get sort of good throughput, um, good queue time, and so on. And uh, yeah, so he's got some, some interesting uh, yeah, news and, and discoveries to present there. Thanks, Kuchi. Uh, then we'll have a quick look at what's coming up and uh, a few yeah, a few metrics of what's been happening at NERSC in the last month. So let's we'll start out with our uh, win of the month sections, the opportunity to uh, either show off or, or shout out of an achievement that uh, you've had or somebody else has had. Yeah, it can be big or small. It can be you know, from getting a paper accepted, uh, solving a bug that's been you know, giving you some grief for a little while that took some took some digging. Um, maybe that maybe you've got a uh, an achievement that's good to note as a, uh, a high impact scientific achievement award or an innovative use of high computing award. So uh, yeah, please uh, tell us a, a little about it what you did, what you achieved, what you learned, and yeah, any, any tips that uh, others yeah, might benefit yeah, others um, here at NERSC. Uh, this is Koichi from PNL. Hey, Koichi. Good to see you. Hi. Uh, good to see you, thanks. Uh, I just want to, for me, win of the month, and maybe for many others, uh, the two train events this month I really enjoyed from NERSC. One is the Parimata uh, training, uh, and then last week we had NVIDIA HPC um, SV uh, development kit uh, training. I learned quite a lot from those two training events and just started to uh, try and offloading uh, this existing Fortran code we use to generate a computational mesh. It takes a really long time. So now I started to try to port this to a GPU on Parimata. And I started working with the support staff in NERSC that uh, uh, first email um, the quiz that pointed out that <laughs> my first uh, beginner mistake is that I have a subroutine call within the code that being uploaded to GPU, which we need some other additional cares uh, to do that. And then also tell me some advice from going, moving from large blue loop to fine grain blue loop to make it more effective to, to this uh, GPU flowing. So that's sort of uh, the, the one of the things I really learned this month. And I really appreciate this two training event. That was really good. So yeah, thank you. Some that's uh, good to hear and, and some yeah, good tips there about um, yeah, the, the way that you offload to a GPU might not be the same as the way you, um, you know, optimize or parallel thing, parallelize things for um, 
yeah, for other circumstances like OpenMP or MPA. And thanks also for that reminder about the trainings. Um, the, I believe the slides and recordings are up now for those. Uh, so you can find them under the, the training section at www.nurse.gov. But yeah, um, for those who didn't make it, we had uh, two sets of trainings. One on an introduction to Perlmutter matter generally, which covered a lot of the, the tools, and the other on an introduction to the NVIDIA um, program and, and tool suite. So yeah, and it's uh, really good to hear that they were uh, helpful. Thanks for that, Becky. Anybody else like to shout out? Um, an achievement. Ah, oh, look, I see Helen's just posted in the chat the links to those two trainings. So if you did miss them or if you saw them but would like to go back and refresh your memory on, on some aspects, uh, click through there. So the sort of flip side of uh, win of the month is today I learned, um, which is a, a, you know, a similar kind of format, but you know, it can be something that uh, tripped you up that you might want to you know, give the rest of us a forewarning about, or something that you know, might be good to add to NERSC's docs. And uh, I've seen in the last uh, week or two, actually, we've had a, a few merge requests. So you can also contribute to the docs by, uh, you know, uh, adding, yeah, using using GitLab to uh, add uh, comments or make edits and pass them to us that way. Uh, somebody started to speak up, but I didn't quite catch who. No, it might have been a, a microphone glitch. So yeah, as well as um, achievements, if uh, anybody has something they'd like to tell us about that, that they learned or got stuck on and, and would like to learn, that might be either yeah, something we can, we can talk about here or um, yeah, give, uh, give the rest of us a, a tip to follow up on. I think there's definitely a lot of tips to follow up on in the uh, in the training in the last couple of weeks. Okay, maybe we'll uh, move on then to announcements and CFPs. We definitely have a few, and the biggest one is, in case you missed it, welcome to uh, Allocation Year 22, which began uh, yesterday with the maintenance on Cori. Um, so there's a, a whole bunch of detail in the Nurse Quickly email and in a, you know, a few other places, there's uh, links from that weekly email. That's a good place to, to begin. Uh, a few important differences that, that are worth watching out for is uh, for PIs, did you remember to mark your continuing project members? And if you're not a PI and you find that all of a sudden you can't submit to your project or can't access something, uh, take a look in Iris and make sure that you are still in it by Default, um, we don't carry over users from one year to the next um, uh, in terms of which projects they're in. Uh, yeah, PIs and PI proxies do need to sort of yeah, indicate who is in the pro who is still in the project at the uh, beginning of each year or end of end of each year. So 
if you are finding trouble with that, take a look in Iris and uh, drop, drop your PI a line. That's sort of the first thing to try there. Um, other important thing in the new year, we have a new default Python modules. So all of last year, the default was 3.8, Python 3.8. This year, it's Python 3.9. Uh, there's been a few other upgrades. Um, you know, we're using, uh, I believe it's called uh, Mamba, which is an improvement on Conda. I think the interface is still the same, but it's a little bit faster. Uh, a couple other modifications there. So for Python users, that's probably you know, useful to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing you'll notice when you're looking at the uh, your job costs and nurse hours that uh, for this year, they've been recalibrated. We were using a nurse hour unit that was uh, based actually a few machines ago on, I think a, uh, a hopper or possibly Edison. I think it was a hopper node hour, um, which is to say the uh, kind of a, you know, a amount of work in units of what a previous machine could do on a single node in a single hour. And yeah, a little bit of time's gone by and those uh, numbers we're getting yeah, further and further away from, from reality of the node, so we've recalibrated. And what we're using this year is, um, uh, we've recalibrated it to what's expected to be a Perlmutter CPU node, which is to say a phase two node, so we don't have those quite yet. Um, so a Perlmutter CPU node will have two sockets of the AMD EPIC processors that Perlmutter phase one has. So Perlmutter phase one has one socket plus GPUs. So the new hours are recalibrated to uh, you know, Perlmutter sort of node speeds. Uh, if you're using Perlmutter, jobs are still currently free of charge and will be for a little longer. Uh, you'll also notice that GPU node hours are a separate allocation from CPU node hours. Yeah, they're, they're also currently free. Um, eventually, you know, when, when Perlmutter becomes a full production machine, those will start to be charged. But uh, if you have code that's GPU ready or uh, preparing code for it or are close to it, and you're not already on Perlmutter, you can request access and uh, start testing your code out there. Okay. Uh, other important announcement. It's been a few weeks now, but if you dig back through your email, you should have uh, seen some email invites to participate in the NERSC annual user survey. This is really important for NERSC. Uh, we use it both to uh, you know, get feedback and get a sense of um, you know, the, how our users are experiencing the machine and, and NERSC services over the last year, uh, what we should continue doing as we are, what things we need to improve on. Uh, and uh, we also use it in our, uh, to generate some of the metrics that we use when we're reporting to Department of Energy, which is yeah, important in terms of uh, funding as well. So if you haven't already filled it out, please do uh, flip back through your email for a couple of weeks. Look for one from this uh, nbriresearch.com, nurse at nbriresearch.com. That's the, uh, the third-party survey company that's managing the, the survey collection for us. And uh, click through there. So Corey default modules uh, did not change in the AY changeover maintenance that happened yesterday. There will be an update of those in the March maintenance though, which will be a, a minor change. Actually, no, it might potentially be a, a fairly large change. Uh, coming up, oops, coming up tomorrow, we have our first uh, Julia at Nurse call. See the weekly email for some details about that. And before we go to others, I see in the chat, there's a couple of comments. Um, uh, so Taran has a question about uh, rolling over and not going through smoothly. So I think there was uh, maybe in uh, early science QoS or a couple of situations where things didn't go smoothly immediately and 
uh, from from kind of the you know, the system side what was what was rolled over but i believe that's been fixed now so if you were having trouble yesterday take another look today and uh see if it's solved others as far as we know i uh, should have you know gone through as according to checked um yeah. uh, some people may still you need to nudge their PIs, but if you are finding that something's not working, yeah, as, as Helen's pointed out um, or, or mentioned, uh, yeah, please, please send us a ticket if you find things that are not working cleanly. Are there any other announcements or CFPs? So that's what I have from nurse side. This is uh, also an opportunity for you know, people in our music community to um, tell us about things as well. So you know, if you're involved, for instance, in a uh, you know a conference or event that nurse users might be interested in, this is a, a good opportunity to uh, spread the news a bit. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to add on that uh, nature? Hey, Steve. This is Heya from nurse. Hey, hey. Um, I, I, I will be asking for this to go out on the weekly, but I thought I would go ahead and say it now is that um, uh, uh, LBL, so a couple of different divisions uh, are uh, co-organizing something called the Monterey Data Workshop. So in 2019, there was the first Monterey Data Conference. Um, we've been trying to hold it again, but with uh, current travel conditions, it's been difficult, but we wanted to hold a workshop in April um allowing us to share some you know good information on ai and machine learning so we're calling it the convergence of hpc and ai so uh providing an opportunity for early career scientists or you know just just about anyone but you know i think early career has been hit pretty hard recently um to get an opportunity to talk about their work it's very lightweight you know not full papers just abstracts on talks and panels um, an opportunity to get together and exchange good ideas so please do submit uh, uh submissions are due by the end of the month sounds great and i put um, the link in the chat yes thanks for that link um, yeah, I remember. I think that conference was quite uh, popular and, and had some some interesting outcomes in um, a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, we're hoping that also... this will feed to it, right? So the same organizers from the data conference are organizing the workshop, and we're hoping that we yeah. can, you know, drum up some interesting content early and then feed it into the conference. So it's a good way to get invited. <laughs> Sounds great. And is the is the workshop um, virtual, in person, or both? So I think um, to be safe, we're doing virtual. And if something towards the as it gets closer to April, like looks like it's going to change, we might try and add some sort of um, in person component to it. But I think that will be the add on versus the the norm will be virtual. Yeah. Sounds good. So so travel. Uh, shouldn't be a preventer. We'll try and make What's it that? fun virtually. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. It should be a, a good opportunity for, yeah, for users to, uh, I, I guess, show off and talk about what they're doing. Thanks, Sarah. Any other? announcements that uh, people here have. So I think we're slightly ahead of our, our usual timing, but that's, uh, that's all good. Um, Koji, would you like to uh, start sharing a screen or stop sharing? Sure. Okay, yeah. So, Kuchi Sakaguchi is from uh, Pacific Northwest Lab. He's been a, a very active uh, nurse user and participant in the nurse users group for a while now. And yeah, we've been looking forward to, uh, to seeing his findings on some work he's been doing uh, recently. Uh, I know that there's an aspect of uh, Q structure or, or Q, what do you call it? Um, 
yeah, Q eight nine ish. Yeah. Yeah, a special or, job yeah. Um, configuration yeah. uh, things here. I think will be great. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I think oh, here we go. Stop share. Okay. Oops. One moment. Oh, uh, Lim, sorry, I have to leave meeting one second to change my setting, privacy setting. My machine. Uh, uh, yep. Set, yeah, set to not to give control to Zoom by default, it's a lab uh, desktop. So let me, I will come back quickly. So sorry about that. No worries. So I guess while well, we have a, a few minutes, um, while well, Coach is preparing his um, uh, settings, interested to hear if anybody in the meantime has thought of uh, something they'd like to flag as a, a, either today I learned or a, a bit of a win. Well, yes, sorry for the, I'm back and I'm now sharing the screen. And can you see my screen and looking good? Okay, and I'm gonna start my slideshow. Um, okay. And uh, you guys are looking at the slide view, right? Not the uh, presenter view, hopefully. Yes, this looks like the right view. Okay, thank you so much, Steve, and uh, thanks for the all the uh, uh, users and mask staff for checking out my talk today. So um, uh, I have about 12 slides and the first half is to introduce what the climate modelers do to give a context for the last uh, half of the presentation. And really I'm talking about my experience of uh, optimizing my whole workflow. And the uh, important question for me is as model throughput or how fast model simulates climate per job or per hour annual or fiscal year is, is my question. Okay, so briefly, so I'm a research scientist at PNNL and then doing, studying mainly atmospheric turbulence in the planetary boundary layer and related moist convection that, you know, this cognitive clouds that, you know, uh, quite often formed as a result of interactions between the surface and the atmosphere. And those are also link uh, between small scale and large scale atmospheric phenomena. And that's also my uh, scientific focus. And one model to handy, useful model to study this is the one I'm showing here as an animation. It's called a variable resolution grid. Many models are having this functionality now. So in this particular case, I have very fine four kilometer good spacing over the US to better resolve all those strong storms. And it's global model, but the rest of the uh, globe are using much coarser uh, grid spacing. So to save some computational cost, but still allowing uh, two-way interactions between this uh, focus of the region and outside. And then, so uh, we study climate and this is, sort of how we see the Earth system, I believe, just uh, representing my own view though. So we have Earth and we wanna know about the climate, particularly simulate and then project the future. And we divide our climate component into different components. So to facilitate understanding and numerical modeling. And then this is reflected to how does we design the climate model. For each component, we have numerical models, for example, atmosphere, land, ocean, sea ice, and the other components. And these are couples, so-called like coupler. We have this uh, name, scene, which is used by two climate models, one by DOE's own climate model, ECSM, and its sister model, CSM. And um, as you can see, it's a really huge uh, chunk of mainly 
for current generation model, it's Fortran uh, code. I have want to go into detail a little bit later, but uh, it's uh, it's a community code and developed by the community, and many users uh, just contributed. So uh, it's uh, it's very complex. And uh, if we just focus on the atmosphere part, um, just quickly go through to give you an idea of what we mean by numerical models. So a large part of the atmosphere is this dynamics, fluid dynamics, or Navier-Stokes equation. So we usually uh, simplify the governing equations. Given the scale, we can make some approximations. So that's sort of the conservation for the momentum to look like. And then we have several terms. And then we discretize that in time and the space. To speak of this, we cannot solve this analytically, so we have to solve numerically. And then this is typically how the grid box uh, look like for those Earth uh, climate models, particularly the atmospheric component. And then we numerically integrate in time at each grid cell because once we discretize this and write and uh, rearrange. Then the future value is just some of spatially dependent processes operating now. So that's why we use numerical models and how we project into the future. And I said this is a part of the atmosphere because I'm not touching these uh, important terms in this equation. One is unresolved dynamics that the scale smaller than the grid box. We have to do something because it's still important. And processes other than fluid dynamics has to have a different form of equations or empirical uh, representation. That's those are really big uh, research topic. And then, so if you just do the atmosphere component only, this is already very complex because we have. So if you go into the directory of this model, we have some uh, directory has scripts to build a model, like make file. And then source code has different processes, has its own directory. And the one I just talked about in the previous slide is about dynamics, or fluid dynamics, or we call it dynamical core. And then these models offer actually multiple choices for the users. For my research, I'm using this experimental model MPAS. And in this directory, I have these files. And this is actually standalone model outside and imported to this code. So we have external directory, we have a lot of another photon code. The other physics, what we call, has this uh, process I just mentioned unresolved dynamics, radial transfer, molecular scale processes, and chemistry has its own subdirectories. And then in each directory, have so many files. For this case, we have 122 files and different processes. Each file representing some part of uh, distinct atmospheric processes. And then for a given process, we have some multiple choices of different algorithm or different scheme. And each scheme developed by different groups. Um, let me change to the laser pointer. Uh, how can I do this? Shoot, it's changed. Oh, yeah, okay. Laser pointer, here we go. Yeah, um, so it is community model. So each scheme developed by different groups from the labs or universities, including the students. I was one such a student uh, wrote some Fortran code without knowing anything, almost nothing about HPC or optimization. So those chunk of code constitutes those huge model. And then if you remember, we introduced uh, KNL hardware was introduced. We have this NASA program that designed uh, to some test cases to optimize code from conventional to multi-core architecture. There's some examples in this case uh, from CSM model, but those are focusing on those uh, sub components. Very important computationally, but still. Uh, just these two components. So it, uh, this is another way of see how gigantic those code, codes are. So the main point is really not too easy to optimize for just given project group. Even though more systematic uh, development effort is being done for the DOE's climate model. So 
uh, touch on this a little bit later, but there is some more uh, refined processes to how to proceed with model development. So that's one challenge for our climate community. The another challenge is more scientific. That is uh, time scale and the chaos or sensitivity to the initial conditions of this global atmosphere or climate systems. That constrains how, constraint how we, what simulations we have to run. Uh, for example, you know, for climate, you know, we talking about global warming from CO2 and other uh, greenhouse gases, which is involve carbon cycle in you know, CO2 in the atmosphere, absolutely in the trees or what is the ocean. Those are time scale of millennia. So one application, they have to run simulations for uh, thousands of years. For these cases, grid spacing tend to be coarse. But for more uh, societal impact related studies, usually integrate the model for about 100 years. But then we are trying to address this chaos part by running many, many simulations by slightly changing initial conditions. That goes to, for a given model, we repeat the same simulation 100 times, for example. That's also very expensive. But those grid spacing are not enough to realistically simulate some of the processes, particularly uh, storms. So then we have to go down higher resolutions, but inevitably with shorter uh, time period. But uh, the, in return, we can get those very realistic cloud fields from uh, this old model, except for one, one is observation, but all the other is just a model, global model simulation. Given those, uh, so for one of my projects, I was tasked to run such one of those climate simulations using this variable resolution global models. This is, in terms of the resolution, this is a moderate grid resolution with this many grid columns and this many vertical levels gives about 4 million grid, grid boxes. This is experimental code, so we didn't have an open MP support, we just use MPI. And then I, we, for our project, we plan to run this model for about 44 years for the historical and the future period. Uh, based on the test simulations, we know one simulation once takes about three hours of real time using this many nodes on the KML. On Edison, that was faster, but uh, this is already uh, same transition to COVID, so I'm, I use KML as a main machine. And typically, I submit a job for requesting about five, three to 10 hours. For this simulation, I usually need eight hours to be safe for some uh, node failure or slowing down of the storage space, for example. So we have enough time for the two months of simulations. And at each uh, end of each job, this kind of model code uh, writes what we call restart file, so we can continue in the next job. So given this, how many yet to run, and then the model throughput estimation is, uh, we may need about 300 jobs to be submitted. If there is no queue waiting, this becomes, uh, if you just run as planned with six hours for two months, then that takes about 66 days. That's not too bad. Maybe we can finish testing analysis, and maybe we can report uh, the write a paper in maybe one or two years. However, we need to consider uh, the queue, uh, the queue time because it's community architect, uh, community HPC system. So that was my uh, interest uh, goes on, and I contacted Steve uh, to help me to get some information. And before showing some statistics on queue wait time, I do follow uh, best practices in the NASC documentation. This is really our best friends. In particular, uh, the visible huge impact was by setting appropriate last star file stripping. We got some link to the documentation. For some high resolution simulation, I showed uh, animation area, something like that. That setting this uh, appropriate 
uh, swiping reduced two hours of writing single file to just 15 minutes. This is a restart file I just talked about. And as a IO was also gets faster. So that has huge impact on my uh, workflow and productivity. I also follow those other um, best practices, for example, uh, Bcast option to co copy model executable before doing SRAM actual simulation. And then uh, maybe use one switch, the closer nodes together to reduce IO uh, communication cost. And then other some uh, um, tricks that you can maybe go to the documentation later. I haven't yet tried bask buffer, but Steve again already gives some advice to how to implement in this complex CSM model call. So I'm yet to try that. Um, I might uh, report the results in one of those monthly meetings in the future. So given these best practices, uh, so I did, did as much as I can to run simulation faster once I get the queue. So the question is when I get the queue. So what I'm showing is the statistics, one year average regular queue wait time on Kobe night landing. Uh, and it's shown to be as a function of requested hours and the request number of nodes, starting from just single nodes to a huge number of nodes. And you can see it's really, really depends on those two quantities changes a lot. Uh, the choice of my 14 nodes and eight hours uh, slight kind of empirically uh, depended on this, my uh, queue waiting time, but this is really make it more specific. And in the bottom, I uh, averaged some of those uh, groups into a smaller number of uh, uh, groups so that I can see more clearly that's numerical values. So again, this is requested hours in uh, X axis. The y axis is the Q wait time again on an average. So if we use, for example, one to 30 nodes, this dark blue, that's starting from like a few hours Q wait time, if it's because hours very short, but it goes much larger, more than 20 hours, if you request longer. And even if you request 30 hours or more, maybe it could, you could end up waiting. Uh, 70 hours. Hot spot is this 32 to 63 uh, nodes are very popular, particularly around 10 to 13 hours. You might end up really 100 hours waiting um, for, for your get queue to get in a regular uh, priority. For my choice for this particular resolution, it's about 12 hours uh, average uh, mean queue time. Then I can add that number to correct my estimate of the real time to get my job done. Now, instead of 66 days, it's about 200 days. And then if we just consider as a manual work and in downtime, it's now it becomes like one year uh, job rather than three months or quarterly job. This really affects how I even propose how many things we can get in the you know, proposals when the PI asking some questions. And then, so we cannot simply, for example, I know my model code by using more MP ranks or more nodes, we can get faster, simulation gets uh, done faster, like two months, maybe one hour, but then that some oftentimes make Q average uh, expected Q time longer, so it doesn't really always help. And then quickly, this is a result for the Haswell. That's even, you can see from the color, by the way, color is number of the um, uh, average Q rate time, it's even longer. So that's one of the reasons that even though our code is not so optimized for multi-core night landing. I will stick to the, the night landing to get a better queue. And also it's cheaper for machine factor. And so that's pretty much the main points. Uh, just another statistics or my understanding is about uh, simulation cost as we increase the size of the program. Because for our community, science pushes to a higher resolution, as we saw previously. 
that higher resolution means many good coins, so it's bigger problem. So I, the problem becomes bigger and bigger, so we have to use more and more nodes to get the job done in a realistic time. So it's a, a concept weak scaling uh, problem. Given the NASC's current charge policy, if the problem size increase, I think the cost has to increase. I think the cost can stay constant for only perfectly strong scaling so that uh, if the problem size bigger, uh, uh, I think I, it's been a while actually I wrote this uh, slide, so I have to think. But uh, hold on. Yeah, uh, perfect strong scaling. If we increase, uh, so only given problem size, if we increase number of NP ranks by the twice, then runtime gets shorter in half. But uh, for us, we are interested in having bigger and bigger problem to resolve better those other phenomena in, in better with better grid resolutions. And that's what I was asking in this slide because I run simulations, global simulations with different grid resolutions, very starting from very coarse 240 kilometer grid spacing to 30 kilometer grid spacing or variable resolutions going down to 12 kilometer grid spacing. And at, for each resolution, I kind of empirically choose number of MP ranks uh, or how many hours to request. And across different resolutions, the best fit line here is, of course, as expected, worse than perfectly weakly uh, scaling efficiency of, of one. And the gap getting bigger and bigger. So I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. So number of MPI tasks in X axis is a simulation cost in terms of NASC hours per simulation year. Um, and then this uh, picture is the same if I swap X axis to the number of grid columns. So it's getting higher and higher resolutions, cost increasing in with a steeper slope than the perfect weak scaling as expected. So meaning, uh, our climate community needs more and more and ask others in a, in a proposal as in time goes and then, then you know just simply uh, assume our model calls keeps the same rate of increase as we have used more nodes and uh, so that's pretty much all I have and in the last slide is some challenges I already mentioned in my own thoughts. For night landing, and maybe different in part matter, but uh, we see in general, queues less than three hours are much less crowded and you can get a queue like within 15 minutes or so. And uh, my personal challenge is for our community, one month in the model time is very convenient time scale because uh, we wanted to learn many different variables in 3D in space, but if I output this every time step or one hour, that's very, takes a lot of IO. So every month we only write a certain statistics like mean or variance for each month. And that's sort of our convention. So if it's possible, I want to learn for one month for one job, but that's getting more and more difficult. And if it doesn't reach a month, we, at the end of each job, I have to write an additional uh, file that keeps track of those statistics for all those expensive CD variables of hundreds of those variables. That's not so optimal. Or optimal. Maybe we could do better online calculation of statistics offloading by GPU, but that's something we as a community we have to think, or even dimension reduction using some sort of machine learning. And also, you know, current because of our numerical scheme is designed to based on some sort of you know a financial difference or similar, that holds some optimal numbers in P ranks because. As we decompose domain into more and more uh, domains, we need to have the ratio of hollow cells to actual cells becomes uh, 
uh, smaller and smaller, and then that makes the model simulation less efficient. But this is maybe because my code was experimental and then doesn't support threading or open MP. That might be different with uh, particularly with GPU offloading. However, as I said, the GPU offloading is not so straightforward for this large community model. So we might go switch to a newer emerging, emerging uh, neural model that does have some already uh, GPU offloading using those um, uh, directive based open ACC for some impasse model or screen the always kind of models newer version is already written in C++ in the Fortran to use Cocos. And yet uh, many model processes are memory bound. So I don't know how much we can really push those uh, user need. And then, in the end, my experience shows uh, just users, both de developers and those people running simulations, need, re require to have more and more in depth each piece of knowledge to debug. Or when the job fails, why job failed? To understand that, we need more and more expertise. So, yeah, I really appreciate NASC providing lots of training events. I really Want to encourage uh, model users to take advantage of opportunities, and that's all I have today. Um, and uh, maybe if there's any questions, please let me know. I try to answer to my best. Okay, and uh, let me stop the slideshow. Actually, can you do you want to keep on sharing for a moment? Because uh, sure. yeah, thanks. That was that. That was a whole lot of really interesting uh, stuff. And before I ask questions, uh, I see there's a, a couple of questions already in the in the chat. Uh, oh, one okay. given asks, "Can we get a copy of your slides? Uh, can we post a copy of these slides with the meeting notes and yes, recording?" Yeah. Yeah, maybe after a while, actually, maybe by now, but I haven't got uh, permission to distribute the copy yet from the lab, but it's already, I requested approval. So once I get approval, maybe I can put the copy and uh, online and on the, yeah, maybe I'll send it to you. But uh, uh, it's uh, many of uh, my personal opinion or understanding, so not guaranteed to have a representing the whole climate community. Yeah, yeah. Even, uh, yeah, even so, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's like, I, I, yeah. I found it a really helpful overview of uh, a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, so so I guess the answer for that one is uh, watch this space. And, yes. and uh, if, if and when that um, will announce it. And, and uh, uh, John asked, are you using all of the cores on the, on the nodes when you're using MPI? Uh, not always. For lower resolutions, uh, I use most of the cores, uh, like 64, but no hyper threads, just purely 64 cores on night running. And I uh, assign four cores for uh, doing the, uh, what do you call this? Uh, Core specialization. That's right, yes, thank you. Yep. But uh, we found our experimental code does not uh, scale the memory well. We just found out from our simulations that so that, you know, if you remember writing the restart file, that part has some redundancy in how to use memory. Um, uh, specifically, each task was saving unnecessarily a global array. And then that it's not using memory efficiently. So once we go, higher resolutions with more and more memory bound at the end of the simulations. So they force me to spread uh, simulations to even larger number of nodes to get enough memory for, uh, for the particular um, one of the tasks that in charge of IO in each node. So in the worst case, I was only using 20-ish uh, uh, cores on night landing uh, nodes. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so using cores. about um, about a third of the available cores, then because of yes. other other constraints limiting how much you can put on a on a single node. 
Yes. So yeah, yeah. Thanks, John. So OpenMP was a like yeah. And uh, I haven't, like I said, yeah. this experimental code did not have OpenMP, so I don't have much experience in combining uh, MPI OpenMP. But uh, newer version does support, so that's my maybe I'm gonna test on that. So yeah, thank you for your insight. Mm, so some yep, some good options for sort of further further development there. So before before I ask, I ask um, uh, any more, does anybody else like to uh, ask a question or or make an observation? You can either uh, just unmute or or write something in chat if uh, that's more convenient. Hello. Yeah, this Hello. is good. Yeah. Uh, sounds like this uh, scalability is a challenge for this existing version of the code. Do you know, is this is not only memory or also IO bounded? IO bounded, yes. And uh, I found also different subroutines, right? different kind of output uh, files. Uh, like I said, um, so it's, again, the challenge to go through this huge model call. So one by one, we found first, uh, by using parallel, we do have a really, really nice parallel IO library being used. Uh, and that's really doing good job, but uh, how, Different subroutines use that library very year long. So, those regular output part is really well tested and then using library in a good way. Restart file component was not so good, but now it's taken care of. And now uh, we are learning this, I just mentioned the last slide, this statistics. When we did not finish one month in the job, they have to write statistics. That part of the subroutine was also not really doing a good job on how to use or utilize those libraries. And that was really taking uh, a lot of time in my experience. And actually it makes, forced me to use a different model for certain uh, applications. Um, yeah, so what exactly is the reason, why do you say it's, if it's less one month, then you mm -hmm. have to print, create a lot of more files for oh. to keep statistics. Do you mean you need those yeah. statistics to get the average for per month yes. or something like yeah. that? Yeah, oh, so okay. if I stop the job in two weeks, probably this file uh, just to uh, keep track of, probably just for the average, just the sum for, for each time, time step or each one hour. And once the month, one month finished, then we get statistics. Okay. Now, uh, another question I have is, so because of weak scaling, do you know, is that IO is the reason for bottleneck or is that a synchronization is a bottleneck or is that computational yeah. memory is a bottleneck? Uh, I don't have the exact answer. From the papers I learned, particularly the one I cited is from IO and uh, a synchronization or a communication about it. But uh, that study did not use the full component of the climate model. And my colleague did a profiling of the CSM call. Um, sorry, I don't really remember the exact answer. I have to go back and uh, ask my colleagues. But, oh, uh, that, that yeah. my uh, another question I have. This is you running on the uh, KNL, right? Nice landing. Yeah. Have you yeah. run this on uh, other machines and seeing different uh, scaling? Yeah. Okay, uh, what are the difference? Scaling, but uh, usually Haswell and Edison was twice faster, pretty much. If you like, okay. use the given same number of nodes or similar number of nodes, or even fewer nodes uh, could be twice faster than KML. You mean uh, the, the, the 
I guess the latency or the response time is much better, right? With the uh, um, Haswell uh, KL than KL? Yes, and uh, or I don't really nail down if it comes down the performance of each core or Haswell just having more memory per node. Yeah, uh, that's also IO is also uh, a point. Even the communication between the cores on the KL yeah. and for Haswell, it's different. Oh, uh, okay. Even on chip communication bandwidth is different. So it's more like a latency, like a, do you think? Uh, not only latency, the bandwidth also as well. Uh, oh, okay, I see. Yeah, different different detail of different architectures will change things. So those yeah. are partly resolved by using threading OpenMP, do you think? But uh, if you can provide some details, then maybe we can make some reasonable guess what part is the bottleneck. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Mm, but, and, uh, yeah, particularly if, if memory and communication is, is a significant yeah, aspect yeah. We, of the We can do some uh, high-level we'll calculations. Probably... Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it, yeah, it yeah. looks like yeah, the, the model that you've sort of assembled here for um, yeah, for finding the sweet spot. You know, there, there are a lot of variables in this model because there's aspects of, you know, what, um, you know, natural times that the simulation breaks down nicely into, as well as, you know, the simulation zone scaling and the, the queue times for different um, parts of the machine. Like, it, it looks like there's, there's probably enough for, you know, a, a very publishable paper just just oh, on the, the performance optimization or the, the, you know, the throughput optimization model here. Yeah, and I, yeah, certainly. And I think probably uh, E3SM community also have a lot of experience. And then because E3SM are designed to be run on DOE machines, including NASC. So I think their users and software engineer have a lot of experience. Then probably we can also include this kind of conversation, I believe. So Maybe this is, a, I, I'm sorry, take a longer than <laughs> I, I, I so, so because it sounds like your application actually divided the functionality upon different ranks. Is that true? Some focus yeah. on IO, others focusing on the computation. That, that's how I set, yeah, there's a, you know, runtime settings I can put from, again, this IO library. And then recommendation from my colleagues was use assign one task for IO per node, but I'm not sure if this particular task does only IO or does both simulations and IO. Uh, in oh, you're not quite sure. Oh, okay. Not quite sure. Yeah. But uh, even for that, is that if it's, I, I'm wondering whether that's per rank dedication or mostly for IOs or mostly for computation. Do you know that? Okay, I don't know, and uh, haven't profiled that in detail. I really haven't really used profiling for okay. this. Okay. This that that this could be useful control. information as well. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think there's some some really interesting discussion going on here, but uh, I'm also uh, aware that we're uh, technically at the at the uh, official end of the meeting time. So what we oh, might do is flick very quickly through the last sort of couple of items um, and then uh, uh, perhaps uh, people who, who do have availability continue can, uh, we, yeah, we can keep on chatting um, after this. But thank you again, uh, Kochi and uh, Dunglai and others for your yeah, really interesting presentation and discussion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Thanks. just for... Last couple of um, comments quickly. So coming up, we've got a few um, upcoming topics uh, looking at uh, nurse docs and also a, a preview of uh, the nurse annual uh, user survey. But uh, we're also very interested in more, um, you know, talks like what Kochi just gave, uh, you know, an overview of interesting work that our users are doing. And yeah, I think we can see that, you know, there, there is so much, uh, yeah, interesting stuff and interesting discussions to come out of that. So, so if you've got something that you'd like to present, uh, 
you know, drop me a line either on, on Slack or you know, via consulting ticket. Uh, quick look at last month's numbers. So Corey had a, a couple of outages that were unscheduled for a file system issue and a cabinet power outage and also the uh, scheduled outage. This is our uh, oh, availability. You look over the last three months and it really doesn't change very much if you look at the overall time. It's, it's been uh, the scheduled availability, which is yeah, when, you, when you remove the scheduled downtime has been up over 99% and the overall availability, which does include, you know, taking out the, the downtime is still up at sort of 97.5%. Uh, capability metric is the fraction of the machine being used for large jobs, which is sort of a, you know, a proxy metric for, you know, for work that's you know, basically very difficult or impossible to do anywhere else. Um, and we have a target of sort of 25% of the machine for that. And you can see over the last year, you know, for most of the year, we've been pretty comfortably above that. And oops, oh, in the bottom chart here is sort of the currently active um, open user tickets. And you can see it sits pretty flat, which basically means that uh, uh, we're keeping up with the inflow of tickets. So tickets are coming in actually at a pretty good rate, but uh, they're also being resolved at a pretty good rate. So that's all for the official part. Thank you again, everybody. Um, Preachy, do you have a few more minutes to reshare slides in case there's further uh, discussion? Oh. Yeah, yes. And uh, people okay. are available. Okay, should I share screen again? Uh, yes, please do. And uh, everybody else, thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, if you need to move on, you know, uh, please do. But uh, yeah, if you're available and interested in further discussion, we'll continue for yeah, another sort of yeah, five or two minutes. Maybe I would just ask one more question here. You said you, you somehow address the restart uh, latency up and uh, I always what tools did you use? Oh, it, it was just a uh, change in the thread count of the uh, where was it? Oh, but, the number of uh, ranks that were yeah. IO nodes. Oh, no, yeah, number of ranks per IO node. And uh, but to me, I was just satisfied by just uh, setting last of us right in shutting down. Ah, um, sorry, for the restart file, uh, that was temporal solution was again to dis distribute to larger nodes to keep enough memory to write and read restart for restart file for the probably the rank zero. Oh, I don't remember actually. Yeah, yeah, for each IO, IO rank on each node. So very inefficient just using the worst case. I used only between 10 to 20 cores per node. And then that part is uh, taken care of in the latest version of the model code by just uh, not saving global arrays uh, when we is a calculate or calculate certain statistic or something because it's a global array and it's really some of the array being saved like coordinate variables as 3D. And then also not only, so we have this grid structure of um, this kind of grid structure. So it have to be saving coordinate of the grid cell center, but also grid cell vertices and grid cell lines. So there's so many global coordinate variables that was uh, saved inefficiently in some part of the model code. And then that is the root cause of that is because uh, the model developer 10 years ago or 20 years ago, this is, has been very generations ago, didn't really expect we gotta run this kind of high resolution simulations. So they did, didn't pay too much attention in how each node, the memory is uh, being used, but they're going to those extreme high resolution really many, many problems now. But for me, I'm not a developer. So my temporal solution is just to use more nodes. 
to get uh, enough memory. Okay. So yeah. it, it can I summarize what I, I heard here? First, yeah. you use more nodes in attention to get the memory capacity. Yeah. You use the less cores per node to avoid thrashing, memory thrashing. Oh, I don't understand this term, memory flashing. Means each core try to get their own data set or mm -hmm. computation working set or whatever to the yeah. same capacity, which kicking out of each other's data set, okay? Oh, or working set. Okay. I see. okay, thank you. Now, the other thing uh, here total is- Total memory constraint per node. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the striping help you to get more IO bandwidth per node on average. Oh, yeah, right, 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 right. Does that sounds a reasonable explanation why you get this benefit by making these kind of changes? I think so, but I wasn't thought about why uh, uh, for striping, this helps to address time spent on writing, but actually the problem of uh, restart file is slightly, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, different. Yeah, so this does show if the model code can write restart file, this does help to shorten the time. But without getting enough memory per node by splitting across more nodes, the model gets just stuck doing nothing during writing restart file. Yeah. Yeah. So and I think, yeah. Uh, you, I think if you can help us to find out when you do the restart, how many cores are actually doing IOs will be helpful mm. as well. Okay. okay. Or can you measure per node how much IO bandwidth actually you know loaded or stored, mostly loaded, into that so node, will be helpful as well. Those are just available from debugging uh, software, I guess. I think you can do some uh, IO profiling tools. For oh, uh, okay. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, something you might be interested in looking at is um, by default on Cori, the, one of the modules that you have loaded is called Darshan, and mm -hmm. that's an IO profiler that uses the mm -hmm. um, uses the MPI profiling interface, I think. Um, okay. And so it runs by default. Um, you can uh, you can remove it if um, yeah, there, there, there are some circumstances where you don't want it. You know. It, it will probably add a, a very small amount of overhead, um, but more significantly yet, because it uses the MPI profiling interface, um, it's not necessarily compatible with other profiling tools. So while you're doing performance analysis, it might be difficult to, to use. But um, mm. uh, we have you now in docs.nurse.gov, if you do a, a search on Darshan, there's a, a link there to where you can find the output file that Darshan generates after each run. Uh, and mm -hmm. they can give you some pretty helpful statistics about the IO behavior of your program. Um, okay. and, and you can you can discover some surprising things. Um, uh, in in one ticket a little while ago, working working with one of our users, we found looking at the Darshan uh, output that even though this job uh, was really just sort of your yeah, reading a bunch of text data um, mm -hmm. because yeah. the defaults for Fortran were to read it in fairly small chunks. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. a, a, a huge amount of extra data was being transferred to, to and from the nodes during reading. And so there was a, you know, a, a lot of overhead um, that wasn't necessarily in. And you know, so, so that profile kind of helped us to yeah, find that yeah. And, and improve it. So, so that might be something that's uh, interesting to look at for further tweaking of the IO aspects. Just quickly, so Dash can look at the information at individual rank or task that is doing, for example, uh, like. Uh, like uh, it does okay. collect that. I think the default report does sort of some summary statistics. Okay. 
even even that we can see the difference. We should be able to see the difference. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So um, I think at least per node wise we should see it's statistically provided. Yeah. I'm not quite sure whether per rank it can tell with okay. that. Mm. But uh, yeah, good starting point sounds like, yeah. So, so something that, that struck me while you were speaking, Koshi, is that so there's, there's yeah. so many different variables going into this model to work out what's the sweet spot. Were there any tools that you either identified as being useful or would be useful if they existed that would make this easier for, um, you know, for, for a different project that was trying to you know, get a, a similar kind of information to what you found? Uh, like uh, we, we, by variables, do you mean um, like a variable, physical variables inside the model simulation, or more like uh, in more... in the the sense of like you were looking at uh, things like the Q wait time based on the number of oh, nodes and the um, and the the length of the job. And then you had an extra constraint of the, the job works well when you divide it into month-long chunks, whereas you've got a you know more IO and more overheads if, if it's in two two-week chunks. And so that sort of adds an extra constraint. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the, the scaling of the model itself, you know, the um the, the optimal point of there, like there's there's sort of a lot of factors that go into what's your ideal um, you know, throughput per year. Uh, yeah. did you uh, uh, I guess what I'm what I'm asking is, is, do you have any tips for you know if somebody is trying to do something similar, you know with a with a completely different model, yeah you know, they they work maybe on um, you know molecular dynamics or you know a, a different field, mm -hmm. but but they want to also find a, a a good optimization. Do you have any any tips for them? Yeah, it has to be two stages, right? One is again optimizing the code uh, for um both speed and then from our discussions uh efficient io so that we have a freedom to choose hours and the nodes for you know accepted uh throughput right um for, for my case uh, being experimental and a big code and lack of our expertise in our project. Our project members are all scientists. We don't have any dedicated software engineers in our project. Uh, so optimizing the model was challenge. And then later we found this re, uh, memory scaling issue. So we only had a freedom to change those uh, variables available when we submit the job. But then yeah. still this information was very helpful that you know that you helped me to get. Then I can see. So in Iris, if Iris has you know even multi-year statistics of this, this is only one year somewhere in, in the Iris website or my NASC. And right. then Something I haven't done that is the variability of these numbers, maybe seasonally or yep. quarterly. Maybe end of the annual year might be busier. I don't know. Uh, sometime in the summer might be busier. I thought that might be uh, useful, I thought, but I haven't uh, really quantified that yet. But uh, more, more, most of the users of the you know, those current model code do not have time, support or funding or expertise to optimize model code, particularly students. So yeah. what they can do is pretty much the same as me, to change those uh, numbers. Yeah. So those information will be, I think, very helpful. And that's one main message I wanted to share in today's talk. Yeah, Koshi, I, I actually, more. yeah, I, I have a, a simple, another simple question. Uh, yes. Is this every time you run, you run the completed test or do the stop and resume type of thing? Mm. 
I don't understand the difference between those two. Can you say that one more time? Because uh, uh, I think Corey has some, uh, what's that? Uh, oh, uh, checkpoint restart, do you mean? Like a, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. May, Did you have know, you used that or enabled it? I haven't, but the, right now, I guess maybe I'm hinting. So when we use this functionality, for example, right now, if for I submit a job, and if, if this simulation does not finish for a specified time period, like uh, three days, it, if it reaches uh -huh. the time limit, it's just a failure. Then you that restart from the beginning? That's right. Or just re rewrite another copy yeah. of the job? But we oh. manually set. We can set, for example, instead of writing restart file at the you know, end of the job or at the end of the one month, I can set yeah. from the model code, OK, let's write restart file for every week or every 10 days. Uh -huh. uh, in that case, I don't need to go back at the beginning of the month, for example, but uh, you know, just uh, most latest restart file. However, uh, uh, yeah, there's no functionality to automatically adjust or decide when to write restart file. Okay. I think that could see some significant difference here not from your application perspective, yeah. rather than from yeah. productivity perspective. Yes. And uh, yeah, so it's really horrible for me is that uh, I run simulations for maybe eight, for eight hours, you know, job, I get the queue, finished 29 days, spending six hours, <laughs> 100 nodes, and then uh, node of failure or some model, just crashed from I don't know floating point and, and anywhere anything instability then I have to just go back and yeah no the failure is the uh, saddest uh, um, uh, yeah time because uh, yeah I often the, do, yeah do not the, the main thing is me. not exactly node failure rather than you long okay. queuing time right so mm -hmm. if you have a fragmented uh, you know machines but you can still use yeah. it for your usefulness, uh, mm. production, uh, computation, then mm. that's a good thing to do. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so on the one hand, yeah, you, you don't want your queue time to run out early, um, but you don't necessarily want to overshoot it as well. Um, the uh, variable time jobs, the time min flag can be an interesting mm -hmm. thing to, to experiment with that because um, that allows you to set kind of a, a maximum queue time that's significantly higher, um, but a time min that then becomes what the scheduler uses to find a slot. And so it'll sort of find the, the earliest slot that's at least as big as time min. And if you get a bigger slot than that, um, mm. you know, your job can continue past. Uh, although if your job sort of checkpoints at specific um intervals um yeah you yeah. sort of want to go going to work in in units of those interview intervals so you might need something a, a little more sophisticated too right so maybe i can for example use that variable time job maybe uh for for example i could uh, the minimum time to finish one month even though I'm sub sub submitting for two months job. And, yeah. And then at the end of the first month, at least I write this type of file. That's, and then even though the job ends in the middle of the second month, that's still a gain for me. But uh, is there any way for the model code to communicate with the hardware system so that model code, for example, see, oh, we only finished uh, 20 days, but uh, the requested hours are only half an hour left. So maybe it's better to write a reset file now. <laughs> that so, so, so that can be done in the script. You can, from, from within the yeah. script, uh, you can run a slurm command to see how much time is left. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah. it would take a, you know, a, a little bit of sort of, you know, coding and scripting, but 
um, yeah, in, in principle, you, you could at the end of a checkpoint look to see how much time is left and decide whether to continue or to stop the job at that point. But that's uh, sort of higher levels, um, not inside the, like S1, right? It's a higher level, um, how do you say, not uh, you, the, um, uh, the model executable, it doesn't communicate oh. that, right? For example, because uh, um, that, that, yeah, uh, that, yeah, timing, I think that when the job starts, model is in photo and name list at the beginning. That's a time right. when the model knows when to write this start file. Yeah. So somehow so we the, can. Yeah, there, there's some thinking need to be done, but uh, I think yeah. that may provide some useful, general useful approach to, to solve that long waiting, queuing okay. problems. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was sort of needed. Yeah. Hmm. Custom solution, but um, but but the information is available. Okay, information is available. Then, yeah, once we can use that information to make the model or executor to read name list again and adjust some setting, that might be possible to write restart file, not you know predetermine the timing, but uh, in online maybe oh. it can determine. Yeah. So oh, yeah, if the you know the time limit is becomes less than half an hour, write this start file. That kind of instruction. Uh, yeah, of, I see what you this, mean. Actually, edit the model yeah. to look. Do I have time to run the next step? Yeah. If not, so what, and quit. what? Yeah. What we can do is maybe uh, maybe when the job you know when the time left is become like again half an hour. Maybe stop integrate model integration and then read name list again, <laughs> or get some yeah. input text file or XML file, the past XML file again, and then update restart file setting. And then if it's time to run write list, and then or or just make the model write restart file at the time. But yeah, let me think and maybe I can talk with some uh, engineer as well. On this so, so coming from the other direction, uh, I guess yes. depending on how well the model responds to, if after you've written a restart file, then suddenly it hits timeout um, so that you only lose a few mm. minutes after or, or, or it quits after that. So you, so you could put sort of a watcher in the script to look for a restart oh. file and when and when a new restart file appears um yes. check the amount of time if there's not going to be enough time to finish the next um oh. you know, to, to reach the next restart file and uh, uh, actually abort the job like can cancel the job and oh okay and then, clean up the mess oh, yeah, from the outside a good idea. that's also a good idea yeah hmm. so i guess the other consideration that you would need there would be um, presumably the time for a, a, a new, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, continuing on is not the same as the initial time. Like I, I imagine the time from the start of the job to the end, to when the first restart file is written is probably a little bit longer than from between when the first restart and the second restart file, because mm. there's some initial ah. overhead to account for. Right. So it, is it is it the variable length job or a different? Um, yeah. So so take a look at variable length job for that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's it, it's not going to be exactly the same, but mm -hmm. I think it's a similar enough. It, it sounds at least like a, a similar enough um, problem to solve that a lot okay. of the same techniques are probably um, yeah valid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. The, 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 what I see is your waiting time is longer mm -hmm. than execution time right? it, it, <laughs> for yes. your turnaround that time. Too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. And indeed. actually, about what? About 50% longer. <laughs> that's right. Yes, that's very really <laughs> typical for my workflow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> 
yeah, really nice. I keep thinking how we can improve this. But yeah, really, really appreciate this discussion. And uh, thanks for so much for the opportunity, uh, Steve. Yeah, I think uh, is, I don't know whether you have time. Otherwise, I potentially can work with you on that. But uh, we'll see. Yeah, you see, I'll try to find Because uh, that's but... something uh, we also work on. OK. Oh, but, okay. Uh, it depends on you know how, how this can set up. But anyway, discussion we can help each other. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it's worth um worth you get touching base offline and uh, hopefully you've got enough information. I guess there's a there's a, a you know, direct message chat option in, in Zoom. You can okay. Swap contact details. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So we we're coming close to 12.30 now, so we should probably wind up, okay. but thanks again yep. for, for this um, presentation and work, Gracie, this, this was, and, and for and, and, uh, Dong Lai and others for the discussion, There's some uh, really interesting stuff here, and yeah, yeah some, some, some really interesting sort of yeah, results and findings and uh, you know, of, of what your experience has been using the system. Yeah, same here. Thank you so much for the you know, discussions and again, opportunity.